Okay, good morning artists. Welcome to Art Adventures. My name is Mr. Andy. I'm the studio programs manager here at Joslin, which means I get to make art with people like you that come and visit our museum. Art Adventures is a drop-in ex uh, art experience that happens weekly here at the museum. It's free for members and it uh, takes place every Friday morning when the museum's open. Uh, usually Art Adventures. Uh, usually Art Adventures is led by our friend Miss Therese, who I hope is watching from home. Uh, and she'll be able to answer your, your questions in the comments below. But since uh, this time of COVID, of course, we're keeping each other safe by staying at home. So I'm going to bring Art Adventures to you each week uh, in, the safe, in the safety and comfort of your own home. For a full list of upcoming Art Adventures, we have one left in May. And new adventures will be posted for June. Visit Jawson.org. If you do not, uh, you can also, we'll also post each week's materials um, on that site. And if you don't have materials today, a recording of today's video will be posted so you can follow along and then make art with us when you have materials ready. Each week we will be inspired by different artists or artworks from Jocelyn's galleries and create our own masterpiece while learning how these artworks were made and what makes them special. This week, we will not be looking at just a single work of art. Instead, we will learn about a common art subject or genre called still life. The term still life comes from a Dutch word, still even. Uh, still life <laughs> is an artwork that depicts inanimate objects or things that sit still, especially things that were once full of life. It is called a still life because everything in that work of art sits still. You don't need to sit still, but the objects in our still life should sit still. Uh, uh, artists have been creating still lifes for thousands of years all over the world. Pictures of food and personal belongings can be found on the walls of ancient e Egyptian tombs and pyramids. They are painted as offerings to sp spiritual beings or in the hopes that a person could feast on their favorite foods in the afterlife. Ancient Greeks often decorated their homes with mosaics and frescoes full of flowers and images from nature. The French word still life is nature morte but it with, in a French accent, Mature Morte. This means dead nature. It's a pretty good name since the Western tradition of still life painting usually includes things from nature that are no, no longer living, like, uh, like, like cut flowers, fruits or vegetables, butchered pigs, fish, or goose. Oftentimes these things were carefully arranged like a fancy meal. Get a load of this fancy meal. Other times, uh, those objects are arranged as if someone had just left the table. Maybe some of the things are left half eaten. Sometimes uh, the meal is left to rot, or bees and other insects could be seen crawling all over each of those objects. Although this genre, genre of painting has been around for thousands of years, and each artist can approach their still lives differently, even if they're painting the exact same thing, each artist can paint those things in different styles. Some artists choose to uh, carefully arrange each object within their still life as symbols to tell a story. Other artists include rotten fruit as a reminder that life does not last forever. Artists at the turn of the century, at the turn of the 20th century, use still life subjects as an opportunity to explore uh, and experiment with bright colors, funky shapes, and wild compositions. The next time you come and visit Jocelyn, you can find still lifes all over our galleries. Sometimes a still life might be part of a bigger picture, like this, uh, like this painting by an unknown artist from the 1500s. What's that? Like 500 years ago. It's a long time ago. This picture is called The Mass of St. Gregory. In this religious painting, we can find a simple still life on the table in the middle, in the middle of this church. We see a table here, and we, if we look closely, we can find objects carefully arranged on that table. Here's, a, here's that table zoomed up, and I've outlined each object. The still life objects here are painted in a medieval style that uses flat shapes. The artist is not concerned or worried about making the objects look super realistic, but observes and represents each object's shape so that we can recognize what each object is. So I can see it. there's a book here on this, on this uh, this pedestal, so we can read the book. There's a chalice. Maybe this is a piece of bread. So we have a piece of bread, our chalice, and a book 
here at the bottom. Other artists in our gallery, in our galleries, carefully paint each object with masterful illusions of space and shading to make the still life look good enough to eat. Take a look at this still life. This one, this still life was painted a hundred years later. What objects can you see in this still life? You can post the objects that you see. You can type them in on our comments. Here's a closer, here's a closer view. So in this still life, what do we see? Can we see here? There's big red lobster. See some fruit. Here's a bunch of little round fruit, probably grapes. A plate. This fruit has an orange peel. Um, that's probably an orange. So still life po uh, painting was especially popular during the Netherlands, uh, in the Netherlands during the Renaissance. These Dutch painters took great pride in making their still life extra realistic. Sometimes the style of painting is called trompe l'oeil. That's a French term that means fool the eye. These artists wanted to trick people, trick their eye, so that they might even think they could pluck a grape from the frame and put it in their mouth. What objects do you recognize in this Jocelyn still life by Jacob Van S? Can you see some of the things in this still life? I see some food, some things we can eat. We can see a, that food is on fancy plates and cups. Almost every object, uh, in the Dutch tradition of still life painting, almost every object was carefully selected by the artist and arranged as a symbol to tell a story. Symbols are those images that, tell, uh, that represent ideas. Oftentimes, bread, I can see maybe some bread over here, and wine were used as symbols for, as religious symbols. Things like lobsters in the picture before and other fancy meat. You see some fancy meat here in the, in the shadows. There's a big hunk, looks like a big hunk of ham. Fancy meat were used as symbols of wealth or greed. We don't know for sure what these items in this picture symbolize, but we can tell that each item was carefully arranged to create a composition that is well balanced with reoccurring shapes that create a pattern and rhythm. If we look, I can see lots of ovals. There's ovals in the plates, big oval here, another oval here at a diagonal to create balance. Even this big hunk of cheese is an oval. A lot of this oval repeats over and over again. You can jump like hopscotch from each oval over and over again in this picture. This, uh, this, this next picture is one of the newest paintings in our collection. This is a picture called Still Life of Flowers in a Glass Vase, from, and it was painted in 1685 by Maria van Ostervik. And this is one of the newest pictures in the galleries. Maria was, was uh, one, one of only a handful of well-known female artists in her time. She was famous for her paintings of flowers that she um, often made for kings and queens. When we look closely at our picture of flowers, if we look extra close, you can even find, you can find bees and butterflies and sh seashells hidden among sapellos. You have to look extra close here. And when you're in the museum, you can look even closer. But I've blown it up. And here, we see there's a white flower in the middle. I've made that white flower larger. And we can look extra close. And when you're at the museum, you can look for yourself. But right here, you can see a big round bumblebee behind with yellow and black stripes. The bumblebee are sometimes a symbol of hard work, since bumblebees work hard to collect pollen to make their honey and pollinate our food while they're at it. Butterflies. There's a several butterflies in this picture. There's one down here at the bottom. Colorful butterfly. Butterflies often represent hope, since a butterfly is born again from the cocoon. Butterflies can also represent fragility, since their wings are very delicate. Sometimes symbols within a picture are more somber. They remind us that life is short, and to remain humble and thank for all the, for the simple things that we have in life while we can. This picture of St. Francis by Spanish painter El Greco includes a memento more, which is a still life arranged, uh, a memento more still life here in the corner. 
of a skull and a crucifix. Let me show you that one closer. A memento mori is a Latin phrase that means, remember, you must die. This skull is, in this picture reminds us that nobody, nobody lives forever. But the crucifix is a symbol for many that means life after death. A still life can also um, appear within a portrait. Remember, portraits are pictures of people. Here's a portrait of two people, a married couple. And when we look closely in this portrait, uh, we, can, we can learn more about these people by looking at the still lifes and the objects that, are, uh, that surround those, those people. When we look at these objects, we can learn more about these people. And if you look extra close next to, that, to the wife in this couple, we can see maybe uh, some books, maybe that's some uh, music, music books and a flute. When we look next to the husband, he's sitting at a piano or an organ. So we can learn that these, this couple likes to make music. Maybe they like to create music together. After, uh, after the invention of the camera, artists were less interested in making their still lifes look super realistic. Uh, the camera could do that. So artists like uh, Paul Cezanne and Vincent Van Gogh started to use still lifes as an opportunity to experiment with their bright colors and brush strokes and shapes. These experiments led other artists to experiment. These, Vincent Van Gogh, Paul Cezanne, Manet, and others uh, encouraged people to experiment and, and push ideas of abstraction even further. An artist from our galleries called Maurice Del Vlaminick liked to use bright colors and simple, flat shapes. So these objects in this still life aren't made to look super realistic. When you make your still life, we don't need our objects to look super realistic. In this still life, these flat shapes and colors uh, combined elements of modernist movements of cubism and fauvism. Even this work of sculpture from our galleries might be read like a still life. This is a work of sculpture by an Omaha-based artist named Thurman Statham. We can look at and we can read this as a still life because it, it includes several small objects that are carefully arranged in these glass compartments. This shadow box uh, like sculpture includes small round glass balls. This is a close up of that same sculpture. This is a close up of another one of the shadow box compartments with gem like glass shards that look like jewels. And in another compartment we can see a skull. This skull is trapped in a glass cube. So today, you and I are going to make our own still life together. And I'm going to give you instructions that will help you to identify and draw the simple shapes to represent the objects that you choose for your still life. And then we will practice creating an illusion of space by overlapping each object in front of each other. And don't worry about making your objects look real. We will each choose to create our still life in your own style. So uh, before we begin, as we do each week, let's, let's make sure we have um, all the supplies you need to create your still life. So, some of you might have a, a supply bag that looks like this. Remember, if you, don't, if, you need, if you need supplies, you can pick up a bag for each uh, for our art, art, art adventures out front of the museum every Thursday, all day long. Um, and for our May art adventures, that bag is pink. So I can reach into this bag and pull out what we need. One thing that we need today is a uh, piece of drawing paper. We'll use our drawing, our drawing paper, our all media or our heavy drawing paper to create your final still life. But I also hope that you might have some scratch paper. Look around your house and find some scratch paper so we can do some, we can make some practice sketches. You can use um, junk mail, newspapers, anything that you have around the house to, that you can draw on. Uh, and then the only other thing we need from our bag today are our crayons. Um, if you want, after we're finished, if you want to, you can also paint your still life. But today we're only going to begin with our crayons to make sketches and then draw our final um, still life observation. Now, but the most important thing that you need that's not in your bag that hopefully you can find around the house or at least three objects. Maybe try to find a large object a medium object and a small object. 
Maybe try to find objects that are different shapes. And we're going to use those three objects to make your still life. So today, I have a small watermelon. That's a nice round shape. I have a tall bottle of soda pop. That's a nice tall cylinder shape. And then I have a box of goldfish. Those three things. I also have a little pie. We might save that if there's time for pie. We can save that for our dessert. Now before we make our, before we uh, begin our, our final still life on our, on, our, on our good drawing paper, let's warm up and let's uh, get our, let's practice with our eye. Let's practice to look at these objects by making some sketches. And I'm, before we begin to draw all of our objects together, we're gonna, we're gonna look closely at each object individually, which means we're gonna draw one object at a time. So uh, decide which object you wanna begin with. Put your other objects to the side. I'm gonna put my goldfish over here. I'm gonna put my soda pop over here. And I'm going to focus on this round watermelon. I'm gonna set it out in front of me, and maybe choose a, Choose the side of that watermelon that I think is interesting. Choose an, uh, I, this watermelon has beautiful patterns, these, the dark green and light green stripes. And those stripes come together and they radiate out from uh, where the stem was attached. That probably has a name. Uh, so I think that's an interesting, that, I think that's an interesting side for this watermelon. Then grab your crayons. Grab your crayons. You can, you can sketch using any color that you like. I'm gonna use a dark color. I'm gonna use a dark crayon to, to make my sketch. And remember, when we're sketching, because we're using crayons, we don't, we don't need an eraser. When we're sketching, we're not worried about our mistakes. Sketching is a way for artists to practice our ideas. So as we sketch, as I begin to sketch, I'm gonna press lightly with my crayon, which means I'm gonna make a very soft line. Might be so soft, you, it, it can be. It might be hard to see, but I'll bring it up close to you. And I'm going to look closely, and we want to just draw the shape. I'm not. I, we don't. We're going to draw the contour of each object, which means it's like the outline of that object. Don't worry. We're not going to worry about adding in all the stripes. I just want to draw all the big, the big information, all the the big shapes, maybe some of the big details. So I'm going to sit back. Maybe close one eye and hold out a thumb. Do what you need to do as an artist to take a look at that object. And I'm gonna, I'm, uh, when I look at this watermelon, I notice it's not perfectly round like a bowling ball. It, it kind of has, it kind of undulates. It's, it it's, uh, has some, one side kind of bulges out, then it kind of gets a bit more flat. I'm gonna try to pretend like there's a little tiny bug crawling around the edge. And as it crawls up that curve, I can sketch an uh, upward curve on my paper. When my bug gets to the top of the, the peak, it starts to slide down, like it's on a sled. Comes down like this, and I'm sketching softly, remember? I'm not worried about making this perfect. I'm sketching a soft, soft line. I'm gonna continue that as my little bug crawls, I'm looking closely at this object, this, the edge of my watermelon, kind of comes up like that. That, wa that bowling ball would go right into the gutter. Be, this is not a, very, it's not a very round shape, but that's the shape that I see in my watermelon. And if I don't have each of that line just the way I like it, I can continue to sketch. I can come in and refine that line. Maybe this one goes, it goes up a little bit here. And I'm still pushing softly. Then once we've, once I know which lines I want to make permanent, all the lines I want to keep, then I'm going to come in with my crayon with some muscle. Take your crayon and push hard, and slowly create my. Maybe so hard if you break that way. I now I have two crayons. Push down hard to make all the lines that you want to keep permanent. Just like that. Now I can add some of my some of my details. I might start with in the center of all my stripes, where that stem of my watermelon was attached. There's kind of a, a, a burst, a, a circle in there that I can sketch in, and then I can sketch in maybe some of these stripes here that radiate from that 
Miss Miranda's a gardener. What do we call this? Where the stem attaches? Where the stem attaches? Where the stem attaches. There we go. <laughs> Technical terms we learn. <laughs> Okay, and we're just, remember this is, we're just warming up. So I don't want to draw all my details. I'm just, I want to get familiar with this object. <clears throat> if, I, uh, if I want to get it extra familiar, I might give that watermelon a twist and draw it again. I could fill my whole page with watermelon, drawing this object again and again and again, so that I, when I begin my final composition, and we start to make, to draw all three objects together, I have some good practice. My eye has looked closely at every inch of this watermelon. Maybe give it another toss. So you can continue today. On, when we're finished together, I hope you'll continue. You could draw all the objects in your house, one by one. Draw all the objects underneath your bed. Create still lifes and study closely each side of that object. All right, let's, let's, now I'm gonna practice with object number two. Let's, uh, let's, let's start, let's, let's now, let's move on to our, my goldfish. Maybe I'll draw my goldfish in a different color. And just like our watermelon, we're going to sketch it. But this, this goldfish box is much more geometric. This box of goldfish, this cardboard box of goldfish, was made in a factory from a flat piece of cardboard that's been folded to contain my goldfish. Maybe we'll use orange since goldfish are orange. So I can use my same piece of paper, and I might just find a spot put my, my box of goldfish in front of me, and now I want to look at the different shapes that I see. This is like a cube. There's one, two, three, four sides. And if I stand back and I can, from this perspective, from where I'm standing and looking at this goldfish box, I can see two sides, two rectangles that come together kind of like this. So I like to start by looking closely and identifying, which means I'm gonna look with my eye and see what shapes I recognize. I recognize rectangle, rectangle, another rectangle, long skinny rectangle up here on this flap, long skinny rectangle. And where this is folded, that's a triangle. So those are the shapes I know I need to draw. So I'm going to sketch in rectangle, rectangle, rectangle on a slant, and a diagonal rectangle. What do they call those? those are, I think that's a rhombus. Triangle. See my triangle? Miss Miranda's gonna come and give us a, a, a close up. Extreme close up. <laughs> rectangle, yep. rectangle. Let's see. Rectangle, rectangle. Rectangle, rectangle. Rhombus, or the, uh, this, this uh, diagonal, rect this slanted rectangle. Skinny rectangle, triangle. And that triangle, I can see a shadow. So I might, I might make that triangle darker to start to make my box of goldfish a bit 3D. We're gonna, we're gonna create our, we'll talk more about our illusion of perspective to make each object look a bit 3D. But now that I've sketched it in, I'm pushing harder. Remember once we practice pushing, uh, making soft marks to sketch each object, then I can come in and make all the lines I want to keep permanent. Now any marks that were practice, any marks I'm not fond of, ignore them. And all these marks that we make extra, we make by pressing extra firm, those, like, those marks are gonna be dark and bold and they're gonna pop out. And remember, we're just practicing for now. Don't worry about drawing all the details. We're just making sure that we're familiar with each of uh, the, the shapes that we recognize in each of the objects. We're, make, we're getting our brain ready. We're getting your eyeball ready. We're getting your fingers ready. We're getting your imagination ready. Right now we're just practicing and warming up for our final, our final drawing. So we have one more object to draw here. Let's make this, we'll use our, I'll use blue for this time, for this Fanta bottle. Now this is a different shape. We had our round watermelon. We have our geometric, our cube that we drew for the goldfish. This shape is a cylinder. It's round on the bottom, straight on the sides, and it tapers, it gets skinny at the top. So I'm gonna, we're gonna, this time I'm gonna draw a cylinder. Now, <clears throat> with a cylinder, we know this is a round bottom, like a circle. This has a bottle cap. It's also a circle. But when I set it down and step back, my perspective stretches that circle out. So it turns the circle into an oval. So I might start at the very top, and just like before, 
with my circle for the bottle cap. And just like before, I'm going to crawl along the edge. I'm going to make a line that follows that little bug as it crawls along the contour of this bottle all the way down here. Now this is our sketch paper, so it's okay. I can even I can draw right on top of this my previous drawing because we were just sketching. We're practicing. I'm looking. I'm drawing softly, loose. If your mark isn't if the mark isn't just the way you want it to begin with, this doesn't have quite as much of a shoulder. It's not a Coke bottle, so maybe I'm going to change that so it tapers, slides down like that. Practice your lines until you get it just the way you want it. Then come back in and make all your keeper lines extra black by pushing hard. <laughs> extra blue by push hard. Come down like that. Now, if there's other details we want to practice, I can see these labelings. There's some I can sketch in some of my label. I'll put this Fanta Fanta down here. This Fanta Fanta bottle. It's got some ridges on it, so we don't drop that bottle. So I can maybe draw. I can add in some of that texture those ridges with some lines that some kind of curved lines that will help make my bottle look kind of 3d too when I curve these lines will help make my bottle look a little more 3d we're not worried about making it look perfect it ain't a photograph draw your objects in your style and we each have a different style because we each see things and express things differently so we can continue to draw the more sketches you make the better, the more confident you'll be when you go to draw your final drawing. So you can continue to fill up your page or fill one page full of bottles, one page full of watermelon, one page full of goldfish. But since we don't have a ton of time together, let's move on and get ready to draw our final composition. So put your crayons down for a minute. Grab all three of your objects. Give that to Miss Miranda. Grab all three of your objects and before we begin to draw, we need to decide how to arrange those objects. So you need to decide where are your objects going to sit. Make sure they don't roll off the table. Make sure that they can stay put. We want our still life to be still. So I have, a, I have my table here. Underneath this table, I have a block of wood. So we can use that block of wood to lift some of our objects up. You might use a, a shoebox if you want to make to give your still life arrangement some lift. But that way I can put, uh, I can, we want to make an arrangement with your three objects. Practice making an arrangement with one object in the front, closest to you, one object in the middle, in the middle, and one object in the back, furthest away from you. So I might, I'm gonna grab all three objects, and I might start, I might grab that there watermelon, I might put that right on the middle of the table. Set it just the way you like it. Maybe we practice looking at that watermelon, different sides to pick an interesting side. That's a pretty good looking, uh, pretty good looking side of that watermelon right there. Grab, and then grab another object. Maybe this bottle, this tall bottle, will be in the back. Or it be in the back. And when I, when it's in the back like that, can you see this, Miss Miranda? You can see that part of that bottle is hidden. So we'll talk about how uh, how we will draw these objects. <laughs> create an illusion of space by overlapping each object. I have one object here left, this is our goldfish. Box of goldfish can be in the front, perhaps. Take a look at it, stand back, close one eyeball, hold your thumb out, do all your artsy things. Decide if that's the way you want it. Maybe that's not a very, maybe that's not very interesting. Maybe it wasn't as balanced as you liked. Maybe I put both my orange objects in the front like that. When I look at it like this, there's not as much overlap as before. So maybe I try it again. Maybe I, maybe I can even turn my table around. Arrange your object several times. Take, look back and find a composition, an arrangement that you think is interesting, that has balance. Maybe a, an arrangement. Maybe if you have objects in your still life that are similar shapes. Maybe your composition, the arrangement of those objects will create rhythm. Maybe those shapes repeat over and over again. I think I'm going to go with something about like this. All right. Okay. So now I have, I have my arrangement of shapes. You know what? I decided I don't dig that. Let's try it again. You can keep trying yours. Stand back. Even if you start sketching it and you decide, you know what? This isn't interesting after all. 
Start again. Do another one. The artists that we talked about probably drew their objects hundreds of times, especially those people who specialized in flowers. Probably painted and drew those objects enough that they could almost do it from their head. Perhaps, you know, here we go. There it is. There, there it is. Something like that. There we go. I like that. So we want to have one object in front. <clears throat> so for in this arrangement, my watermelon's in front. I'm going to draw that, and I'm going to, we're going to start with our watermelon first. We have one object in the middle. For, for me, that goldfish is there on the left side. And that object in the middle is peeking out from behind my watermelon. And then I think, actually, let's do it like, yeah, that looks, I like that. Then back here, hanging out in the back, in the very back, that's where the Fanta, the Fanta, our Fanta's hanging out. And that Fanta, because the Fanta's in the way back, it's hiding behind our, my goldfish and my watermelon. Miranda, come on in here so you can see. Where, now you're lined up right with my eyeball. That's how I can see those objects. Watermelon front, goldfish middle, Fanta in the back. We're going to start by drawing that front object first, middle object second, back object last. You dig? So let's uh, grab your crayons. This time I'm going to begin. I'm going to use the same color crayon for each object as we sketch. And then you, can, then you can use your crayons to add color and detail once your sketch has been made. I think for my sketch on my final piece of paper, well, you, might, you might choose a crayon that's a light color. That way any of your practice lines and your sketch lines, when you begin to add your details, when you add more color, maybe you even paint, your sketch lines will sort of disappear. So I'm going to start with a, I'm going to use blue, but you could even sketch with yellow or pink or a light color to help, to help you practice your lines. And I'm going to start with that watermelon because it's, it's, it's closest. I want to start with that object because I can see the most of it. I can see all of that watermelon. Nothing is hiding the watermelon. I have a big piece of paper, so I'm going to try to sketch that watermelon pretty big. Just like we did before, now I practice it, so I'm kind of, I've got, I got some, I, I'm, fami I'm familiar with this watermelon. I know, I know every little bump and bruise, and flat spot, and undulation. So I got, I've sketched it and I've practiced it. So I'm gonna sketch in that little part where the stem meets the melon. And I might even start sketching, I can sketch in some of my stripes. Sketch, sketch, sketch. Now I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna, this time I'm not going to make any of this permanent until I've sketched my other objects as well. So now I've kinda, this is, uh, I've sketched for my watermelon. So now I know where each other object will go. And I drew it, remember we drew it light so that we, are, well, we practice our lines. Object number two, the middle object, correct? My middle object, that cubular goldfish. Remember that goldfish is made up of all these rectangles that, of the, from the folded cardboard. When I look at that goldfish, I might close one eye, get down and kind of look at that goldfish on eye level, I can see that the this corner where that piece of cheddar's at is hidden. When I, from my perspective, when I look at that goldfish box, that goldfish box peeks out, Ooh, not that angle, peeks out like this, right about where that stem would attach, right? And that so that first rectangle comes up. And then hides again. And we're sketching. I'm, I'm sketching loose, practicing at first. I might like sketch in all of those different shapes that we practiced before, and then take another look. Do I have each of those rectangles where they need to be? Is it higher than it should be? Is it in the right spot? But I can I cannot draw what I cannot see. So before you begin, look closely and decide where to begin your your line. Anything that's hidden behind the watermelon, you cannot draw. We're drawing from observation, which means we have to see, we have to be able to see what we want to draw. So I think that's pretty good. Remember, I'm not gonna, I'm not worried about drawing details. That could, that's something I can add later. We want to draw all the big shapes. Last but not least, our Fanta bottle in the back. This tall, glorious orange Fanta bottle is peeking out behind my watermelon and my goldfish bottle. 
So if you were looking at this from where I'm, where I can see it, I'm getting down, I'm looking with one eyeball. I can see this one side of the one side of the Fanta bottle pops up behind from from behind my watermelon. The other side of that Fanta bottle pops up behind from behind my goldfish box. So I'm gonna to look to see, I'm gonna to try to find that part of the watermelon where my Fanta bottle begins, put my crayon there to be, to start and draw a vertical line. Cause that's, that cylinder has straight sides that go up before they taper inward. I'm gonna come over here and decide where does my Fanta bottle begin on my goldfish box? Right about there. This vertical line is the same height as that vertical line. And then it slides, it tapers in towards the top of my Fanta bottle where that oval, remember we talked about the oval at the cap. So sketch, 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 just like that. So I can continue to sketch and refine. Now that I have all three objects and now I can stand back and look at my paper. Does this look right? Maybe that watermelon's a little wonky, right? Sketch it back in here. Let's maybe shave that part off. We don't need that over here. Sketch it, refine each of these shapes to make your still life look a bit more accurate. Or if you want to experiment with funky shapes, you could, uh, you could make these shapes look like they're dancing. You can make your still life, remember, create your still life in your style. I can continue like this. Now before um, I'm finished sketching, what I might also do is show us where your still life is. Still life is not floating in empty space. I, have, I can see my table peeks out on the edge here and this is a round table with a tablecloth. So it's kind of round, but it's bumpy on the edges where the tablecloth drapes over the side. I can see another a fold in my cloth here. It comes down like this. Again, we're, we're looking at shapes and the lines that we're following, the lines, the contour lines, the edges of my, my tablecloth. See how this zigzags right here, this angle. That's kind of my sketching in my tablecloth. So we know these tables are this, these objects are resting on a round table. I get I could draw all over here in the, the messy part that we don't show you when we when we when we get on Facebook with you, but we'll leave it out. So this this is this is my sketchbook. We've created some we created space this, with, by putting our our putting one object in the front or the foreground of this still life, an object in the middle, and an object in the back. Once you have it sketched. Now is the time to go back in and add maybe details. And you can get as detailed as you want. So when, when we are finished here, I hope you'll continue to add detail and maybe share your pictures with us. But I can look extra close. If I want this to look like a Dutch painting from the Renaissance, I can make, I, I could draw every detail that I see. Look extra close. Maybe even get out a magnifying glass. Draw every detail. But if you want to make a, a funky cubist still life, Maybe don't worry about your details at all and just make big, big old shapes and even paint all these shapes some funky bright colors. You can use your crayons to add color or you use your crayons to add, to look for your shadows. I can use the edge of my crayon to add shadows to create value. Or after you come in and make all your lines big and bold, if you're drawing on heavy paper or some all media paper, just like we did in, our, in some of our other lessons, you can paint right on top of your crayons. So I hope now that you know how to sketch, you know how to observe, to look closely, to sketch, arrange, and, uh, and draw your still life. I hope you'll continue to practice and draw all kinds of still lives. Maybe, uh, maybe you can even find a still life. Sit down and draw what you see in front of you. You can carefully arrange a still life or find a still life um, in the corner of, a, of your room. Take some time, sketch in your sketchbook, practice, and then make a final drawing in your own style, and then share your drawings, your paintings, and all of your still lives with us by posting pictures to the event page for today's Facebook, uh, for today's Facebook, Facebook event. event. <laughs> I almost, made it, all, almost made it all the way through that. <laughs> Facebook event for today's art adventures and uh, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram and everywhere to find out uh, for updates about all of our art from afar experiences, including virtual camps, which are happening a week from Monday on June 1st. They're filling up quickly, but you can, there's space um, available. We'll zoom from our studio to yours um, all through June. 
And we'll see you again right back here next week for another Art Adventures. Thanks for making art with me. Adios.